As we begin a new Methodist year, we emerge more fully out of lockdown and our worship and reflections are taking a different shape. Week by week in church, we continue as normal on the first, third and fifth Sundays with worship led by our local preachers, ministers and worship leaders. On the second Sunday, we go messy with crafts, games and Bible and table activities for all ages. And there'll be a theme with teaching from the Bible and opportunity to celebrate, sing and pray together. Refreshments will be included at an opportune break in the morning. On the fourth Sunday, we're doing church light using video and discussion groups around a table. And it provides opportunity to ask questions, exploring life and faith among the church family around tables in small groups. There is no obligation to contribute to discussion, but you never know what pearls of wisdom you may have to offer. In these tentative steps of change, we ask that you join us and join with us on a pilgrimage, small steps of faith that lead us forward together. One of the symbols often used of pilgrimage is that of a shell, an ancient Christian symbol that would also be used to pour the waters of baptism. Quite a, a practical application. And each week in place of the pre-recorded services, we shall be offering different stories of faith from characters in the Bible, people on their own pilgrimage, seeking deeper understanding of themselves in relationship with God. And hopefully, as we kind of explore under the skin of real people, maybe there may be an echo in our own lives and we can learn something from theirs. So this week we begin with the Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile. You can find this story in the Gospel of Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 37 and Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 to 31. I'll be including the reading from Mark in this recording. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been Come broken hearted, let rescue begin Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your Love you. 
I watched a film on iPlayer recently based on the true story of the female lawyer who challenged the American laws that upheld discrimination in the workplace based on gender. I'm at that age now where I look back and notice the radical shifts in our culture that people in their teens and twenties, even their thirties, would not believe had happened in my lifetime. How many remember the women's liberation movement it's incredible to believe that when I was born, it was nigh impossible for a woman of ordinary means to divorce her husband. I spoke recently with a friend who took his gap year teaching English in Johannesburg, South Africa, and when putting on an Easter play at a local whites-only theatre, had the theatre suddenly empty when Jesus walked onto stage cast as a black man. This was supposed to have been a Christian audience. As a teacher, I saw the increased integration of children from special educational needs schools into mainstream education. This included specialised support for blind and deaf children. It was amazing too when I taught at a school that had a large contingency of deaf students and many pupils and staff had learnt sign language in order to create a more inclusive community. In this current era, still with its difficulties, it is often difficult to appreciate the inherent prejudice that was prevalent in the time of Jesus. The tribal divisions that were upheld, the illnesses and disabilities that would exclude you from society and worship or even make you an untouchable. And we often look back on the disciples through rose-tinted spectacles too. But in this story today, we're going to hear how Jesus had quite a job on his hands, challenging the inherent prejudices that were embedded in the culture of those who followed him. Have you ever seen someone walk into a room or even into church and thought, I hope they don't come and sit next to me. We're probably all guilty at some time or another from wanting to keep a distance. The woman in this story was considered by some to be an untouchable and the instinct of prejudice is a hard one to break. So, let us now be a member of the crowd as we walk into the gospel story. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him and she came and bowed at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. 
But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. I've always struggled with this reading. I couldn't relate to the Jesus I'd come to know in the Gospels with the language that I hear in this story. However, when first coming to prepare for this sermon, I heard it again as if for the first time, comparing it as well with the account in the Gospel of Luke, which gives us a far bigger picture. And I will be referring to some aspects of that reading. Listening to the account of the Syrophoenician woman in the context of that bigger picture that's playing out here in the chapters that go before and after this reading, I see the frustration of Jesus as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are literally hounding him through the whole gospel narrative. They criticise, they judge, they slander and accuse and they simply do not hear the gospel, the good news of Christ. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus quotes from Isaiah as he just seems to lose patience. Jesus is constantly being accused of doing the wrong thing as he challenges the customs and practice of his inherited tradition. And he challenges the rule of the law when balancing it against the rule of love. And so in the midst of this assault on his integrity, he bites back. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Wow. Well, you can imagine the Pharisees and the teachers of the law ste stepping up their game now. And then enter the Syrophoenician woman. A sharp intake of breath. Pharisees and teachers of the law still following, listening, waiting for evidence to accuse him. And the disciples look at one another. Oh no, not her. Make her go away. She is shouting her testimony. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. A testimony that Jesus seems not to be hearing from those in his own tradition, the people of Israel, the teachers and Pharisees, those supposed to be wise, given authority to teach the salvation of God. They don't recognise him. But she cries out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. I ask myself the question, why does Jesus not go to her? She is really making a nuisance of herself. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. She has everyone's attention. And Jesus voices the elephant in the room. You see, not only do the teachers and Pharisees see her as unclean and not worthy of touch, but the disciples also appear bound by their inherent prejudice and Jesus shames them all. How? He voices the words that are going through the minds of the disciples. We read that they hadn't understood what Jesus was trying to teach them about ritual cleanliness. Can we therefore assume that it is the Jewish disciples that were still treating this woman as unclean. Did Jesus understand that the Jewish disciples were still considering themselves better than the Gentiles, more worthy of salvation? He'd only just recently said to the disciples, are you still so dull? As they just couldn't get beyond the prejudice associated with their inherited traditions. 
And so did Jesus use the words that were aching to come from their own hearts in order to shame them. Jesus speaks. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. You can almost hear the disciples muttering, at last, he's sorting her out. We'll be rid of her soon. And the woman persists. Lord, help me. Do you think the disciples had got it yet? I doubt it. Prejudice runs very deep. And Jesus once again gives voice to the prejudice of the hearts of the disciples. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Can you hear the disciples? Yeah, get in. And then the punchline, quite literally, punching the wind out of their sails as the woman replies while on her knees, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Master, she called him Master, and previously she had cried and called him Lord, Son of David. In amongst all these teachers and Pharisees and the disciples who are struggling to understand who Jesus is, Jesus says in front of all these people, Woman, you have great faith. It was a bit of a turn up for the books. Can you hear a pin drop? Can you feel the shame of the disciples? They'd made such a fuss about sending this woman away and yet Jesus had brought her centre stage, not only to minister, her, to minister to her and her family, but to teach the disciples a lesson. And so I ask you again, who is it that you imagine walking into the room and say to yourself, please don't sit next to me? We all have our prejudice. It's part of our life experience, our cultural inheritance, particularly to fear that which we do not understand, that which is not like us. The atrocities against humanity that we are seeing more and more of, the prejudice dividing race, colour, creed and many more reasons to divide, the conviction that those that are privileged are more deserving than those on the breadline. Many more divisions and an indicator of an underlying conviction that someone believes that they are better than another. Let us not forget St Paul who we revere in our scriptures initially terrorised the early church invoking the murdering of Christians because of his inherent prejudice. God shattered his life with the truth of love. Because before God, we are all equal. We are all God's children. There are no insiders or outsiders in God's family. So where does this leave us today? Do you feel like the woman excluded in some way? Or maybe like the disciples trying to follow the teachings an example of Jesus but aware also of an inherent prejudice and privilege. And so in stillness and vulnerability let us come to God in prayer and using the words of the Syro-Phoenician woman, Lord Son of David, have mercy on us. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Lord, 
Son of David, grant us your peace. Amen.